my name is Levs. Um, I'm one of the quite a few engineers and architects and, and managers at NVIDIA who work at, at uh, making these uh, NCF models run faster on our GPUs. Um, so I, yeah, we've been doing it for, uh, I guess, about a year now. So um, this is just kind of one of the aspects of, of, of these things. Uh, so w what are these NCF models? Um, typically, um, recommender, uh, it, they're a new way of generating recommendations. They can be used instead of matrix factorization um, because uh, in, in applications such as recommending what movies to watch, things to buy, um, search results, uh, and, and, and so on, they allow to use more context when recommending an item to a user. For example, uh, the item might have some um, words, uh, significant terms in its title, some, um, if it has a picture, maybe some uh, visual features, or maybe it has explicit tags. The item might have been popular or mentioned on a different platform. Um, it might have been um, interacted with by different, different users. Um, and, and last, of course, the user could have also clicked on different items and uh, on or off the platform, or uh, maybe we know something about the user that, that, that makes us think, oh, it might be relevant. Uh, and so all this context um, allows to, um, definitely helps with the cold start problem, but in general, it, it might raise the accuracy. Um, and uh, the network essentially uh, is trained on a pair, um, on the samples of a user observing an item, uh, which may or may not lead to an interaction. Uh, and to do that, we take, um, you can see in the bottom left, uh, the user and the item attributes, uh, which are essentially Im embedding vectors or semantic vectors. Um, and those, um, some of them might already be known, but a lot of them are probably trained um, and defined during training. So uh, we can just allocate them in this huge embedding lookup table, uh, table of embedding vectors. And uh, then this, these become uh, integer indices. And so uh, after all this lookup, they get pulled, uh, maybe some together, um, and they often get passed through in multi-layer perceptron. And then we calculate uh, some kind of a loss, uh, maybe sigmoid cross-entropy cross or uh, the one of your choice. Um, so you can see that um, the because of all this different context, the embedding layer can get pretty large, and on CPU, it often becomes the bottleneck. Um, it's not because of the flops. Uh, if you take a look at how we compute that, we have a bunch of these vectors that we're adding together, and for a single sample, uh, we essentially have one multiply accumulate per uh, byte red, per, per uh, float point, floating point number red. And if we, even if we increase the batch size, um, because all these, um, because all, all, all of these uh, co contexts might be unique to an item or, or a user, we're not gonna get much reuse. So that's, that's the ratio, that's, that's the um, compute intensity that, that we get. And uh, we can accelerate that. V100 um, has more than 7x the CPU memory bandwidth that you can get on the market right now. And um, we did achieve a good amount of that on a small network embedding. Um, so um, now that we were trying out on the GPU, let's say we did it in TensorFlow, um, what kind of, what, what, what really happens? What, what kind of issues we might encounter? Um, the first thing will probably be the input preprocessing. Um, it's not uncommon for the whole network to run in say one or two milliseconds per batch, uh, which means that um, it's, it's, we need to be really fast in, in terms of how we load and preprocess the data. If you do multi-epoch, if you could preprocess once, it would help. Um, any kind of TF dataset pipeline tuning, say prefetching to CPU and GPU, um, maybe even avoiding using TF record if you have the time. Uh, because it 
it's, it's just a very short amount of time to, to, to load all of these things. Um, if your loss was not auto-fused, um, you might consider writing a custom loss. Um, they are often very simple things with a bunch of kernels. Uh, and uh, then the last, um, maybe um, if there is a way to avoid brute force shuffle, because SSDs like megabyte-sized reads and CPUs um, quickly run out of bandwidth to just uh, copy the indices from uh, the input buffers to the batch. Um, uh, we haven't tried, um, we haven't gotten feedback on, on different ways on how to do that, uh, where, but uh, maybe uh, if you do, ping us. Um, and yeah, so that's just the slide with all these tips together. Um, And um, so basically once we go to uh, multi-GPU, um, because your model is big or because you wanna do it fast, um, essentially um, it de what you do depends on how many uh, vectors you're pooling together. If it's one or two, use NVLink, get a DGX2. Uh, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, but if there are a lot of them, then we can actually use the aggregate GPU bandwidth instead of just, uh, say, NVLink bandwidth if we exchange activation gradient instead of weight gradient. Um, it's, it's gonna, the ratio is going to be obviously the size of the, uh, how, how many vectors you're pulling. And the easiest way to do that is to cut across rows uh, of the embedding vector and gather activations. If you have a bit of time, uh, you can cut across columns. There are, uh, you can see there are a couple of uh, extra things you need to do, but it's potentially a bigger speed up. Um, and it's a bit more CPU heavy. Uh, so thank you for um, all the other engineers and architects who are working on it, and thank you for your attention. Next up we have video to video synthesis. Everyone's been doing so great keeping on time today. Thank you to all the presenters. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Ting Ching. I'm now a research scientist at NVIDIA. So today I'll talk about uh, the video to video synthesis work, which uh, we're going to present at NeurIPS this coming Tuesday. So the goal of this work is that given some uh, high-level representations of a scene, uh, for, e for example, in this case, uh, the semantic maps of a scene, I want to turn it into a photorealistic video, as shown here. So you can see that uh, each frame is uh, high quality, and also uh, the results are temporally smooth. So another example, so given the edge map of the, the scene, we can also turn it into uh, photorealistic videos. You can see that we can uh, capture all the details in the, the trees, um, the cars, the buildings as well. Yeah, and the results are, uh, again, temporally smooth and does not have any flickering. Okay, so what can this be used for? What's the motivation behind this work? There are at least uh, two applications. The first is uh, area-based rendering. So today, if you are given some uh, high-level representation and you want to synthesize a photorealistic scene, you can do it using a traditional graphics pipeline. The downside is that you need to have many artists to design all the geometry and refine the texture, the lighting, etc., which is very time-consuming and expensive. Alternatively, you can just use a trained neural network to synthesize the, the frame for you. And the benefit is that uh, all you need is just data. So for example, you just need to have a lot of uh, sequences of a city that you want to build. And uh, the network can just do all the tedious job for you. The second application is uh, high-level semantic manipulation. So starting from uh, some original video or the image, we can first turn it into uh, some high-level representations like uh, semantics, edges, or key points. 
And then it's usually much easier to edit here. For example, you can uh, simply um, add objects, remove objects, or change the shape of an object. And after you are done with the editing, you can turn them back to um, a photorealistic image. So this part of the pipeline is already largely explored. There are already a lot of uh, segmentations and uh, uh, detection algorithms. But this part is still a little explored and uh, it's the goal of this work. So let's look at some uh, previous work for, some, for the video-to-video -video translation. And uh, to be honest, there's not really um, much of them. But we can just say that in the paper, so we still try to find some. The first is image to image translation, which translates images instead of videos. However, as we'll see in just a minute, it contains a lot of flickering artifacts in the output video, so it does not suit our need. The second is uh, unconditional video synthesis, which turns a random noise vector into um, a video. However, the output video is usually very low, low resolution and uh, very short term, so Again, does not suit our need. The next is video style transfer, which transfer the style of a painting into a video. Uh, it applies some tem uh, simple temporal constraints, but is usually still not enough for our purpose, as we'll see uh, later too. And finally, there's video prediction, which tries to predict the frame, uh, the next frame in your video. However, in this case, both the inputs and outputs are uh, photorealistic images, while in our case, we want the input to be just some high-level representations. So it's a different uh, domain uh, synthesis. So here's the example for uh, if we just apply image translation frame by frame to a sequence. As you can see, there is a lot of flickering and uh, doesn't look convincing. So to overcome this, our method adopts a sequential generator, uh, temporal discriminators, and uh, a progressive training schedule. So our generator generates uh, frames sequentially in the video. It takes uh, the semantic maps and pass frames and try to generate intermediate frames and the flow map. The flow map is then used to uh, warp the previous frame and combine with the inter intermediate frame using a mask to generate the final frame. So this frame then becomes the input when generating the next frame, and so on and so forth. For these parameters, we have uh, two of them, one for image and one for video. The image discriminator uh, will concatenate uh, input maps with output maps and is multi-scale in a special domain. For video discriminators, we're taking uh, neighboring frames in the video and concatenate them with the flow maps to feed into the discriminator to determine whether uh, it's real or fake. To ensure a long-term temporal consistency, we also subsample the frames by different amounts and put them into the discriminator. So this can be seen as uh, multi-scale in the temporal domain. And finally, we have a special temporally progressive uh, schedule. Uh, we start from low resolution and then uh, increase the resolution by combining the, the features from the low resolution training. And similarly, we start from uh, only a few frames and gradually increase the number of training frames. So these two steps will alternate and forming a uh, progressive training schedule that allows us to uh, generate high resolution and uh, long duration videos in the end. So let's look at some results. We compared to uh, two um, state of our methods, P2PHD and CoVST. So P2PHD just uh, translates each frame individually and contains a lot of uh, uh, flickering as you see. CoVST will adopt some uh, simple temporal consistent, uh, consist consistency constraint, but again, as you can see, the flickering still persists, so uh, it's not enough for our, for our need. On the other hand, our result looks temporarily smooth and uh, it's much better than these two previous approaches. 
So here's an example result when we apply our network to a Boston sequence. And although we trained our network on, on the cityscapes in our set, you can see that it still generalizes uh, pretty well to other cities as well. And in this way, we can experience a uh, European style of the Boston city. Yeah, and uh, here's another example when we applied it to um, the New York City sequence. It's uh, pretty different than um, the other sequences we see because it has a lot of skyscrapers <laughs> and uh, the row intersections as well. But again, as you can see in this case, we still uh, managed to generate uh, pretty photorealistic and uh, temporally co uh, consistent videos. Okay. So our network can also uh, try to do other things as well. So in this case, uh, we can try to synthesize people talking using edge maps. So starting from some original sequence, we extract edge maps from them, and then we can um, synthesize new videos based on these edge maps. Our network can also generate um, different people talking using the same uh, input edge maps. And again, the, the results looks temporarily smooth. So here's another example. We can synthesize videos of people dancing using post information. So starting from some original sequence, we extract post information and then uh, synthesize uh, new videos. In this way, we can transfer the motion from one person to another person. And as you can see, even the shadows are consistent with the subject. Finally, we show an extension to frame prediction. And the key idea is that we decompose the prediction into two steps. The first is uh, we predict the semantic map for the next frame, given the past frames. And then using this semantic map, we synthesize a new frame um, yeah, based on the, uh, uh, the predicted semantic map. So here are some um, example results, comparison to two city of our methods. And as you can see, uh, they quickly become blurred as time evolves, while R still stay sharp. So to conclude, it really comes to uh, two questions. First is what can we achieve and uh, what can it be used for? So we show that we can synthesize um, high resolution realistic images, we can generate multimodal results, and we can, gener uh, we can synthesize uh, temporally smooth videos. So what can it be used for? Recall that at the beginning of the talk, I talked about uh, two possible useful cases, uh, AI-based rendering and also um, high-level semantic manipulations. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm Jonathan. I'm here to present some work from NVIDIA Research. So my colleagues asked me to present their work because they couldn't make it here. So hopefully um, it will be interesting. OK, so uh, in this work, we are interested in filling in some objects from a semantic map. So we are given a semantic map, and we would like to add some <coughs> pedestrians, some cars. Uh, and here's a little quiz, which one do you think are fake in, in this image? So all of them were fake or were generated by a neural network architecture. So one by one, what we do is we sample a noise vector and then we add these um, pedestrians one by one. And then you can see they're, they're put in a very meaningful way where they're on the sidewalk, they're not in the middle of the street or in the sky. Uh, and then we also can do the same thing with cars. Let me get the cars, there you go, which the cars are on the street. So the sort of the problem definition we want to have is given an input uh, with some segmentation and some context, where can we put uh, an object? So this problem falls into this idea that we're going to do sort of an image to image translation, but instead of uh, working in the RGB space, we're working with a segmentation, so representations that is a little bit more simple. Uh, this sort of semantic map to semantic map has not been studied as much. Uh, so that's why we're really interested in sort of like digging into that problem. So here's a sort of an overview of the, uh, of the sort of the architecture. 
So again, we get our semantic map. And then what we want to do first is figure out where we're going to put an object. So we have a model for the cars. We have a model for the pedestrians. Uh, and we figure out with a 2D bounding box where we want to put it. And then after that, given a bounding box, uh, we want to define it, the silhouette of the character we're going to put, or the object. And then we want to have this neural network to be trainable end-to-end. -end. So we want to be able to have the gradient flow from the output all the way back to the input. So the where module, the first component of figuring out where we're going to put an object, uh, uses these bounding boxes. The bounding boxes are great because they're simple, and they also englobe all of the silhouette of a character. Uh, and then we want to know, really, the distributions of where these bounding boxes can be in a semantic map. Uh, in, they're meaningful, so they're not in the middle of the sky, for example. So a nice way to learn about distributions uh, is to use, oh, sorry. It, all right, so this is what we're trying to achieve. This is the neural network. Uh, we get our input. We're going to sample some noise vector. It's going to go into some convolutions. Uh, I, I'm making a, a, a simplifications here. And then that's going to output a, a 2D bounding box. And then this is where we want to know where we're going to put that object. And what we, again, what we're trying to do is to learn the distributions of all the valid bounding box given a, sem uh, a semantic map. And then a nice way to learn these semantic maps is to use a generative adversarial network to, to learn these distributions. Right, so what we're doing here is we are generating our 2D bounding box, we're applying them on the image, and then we're sending them to another neural network, a discriminator at the bottom uh, right, and then that discriminator tells us if that, uh, is it coming from real or fake, and then from there we're sort of trying to learn the distributions of the possible uh, 2D bounding boxes. But one of the major problems with GANs, if you've played with them, is this problem of mode collapse where all the output from the generator all go to one single output. So for example here, we, are, we have sampled 100 different bounding boxes and they all go to the same location on this map. Okay, so in order to sort of like remove that problem, uh, we tried different things. And one of the things that uh, we liked was to use an autoencoder. So in the first part of the neural network, we're taking some embedding at some moment, and then we try to decode it. We're trying to retrieve that, that input image that we have. So we're sort of trying to force a neural network to learn about relationship between uh, the different components and how they can sort of re been taken and rebuilt together. Uh, but, and then the rest sort of stays the same. But the problem is, kind of stayed similar. Uh, we're, we're getting more different vectors, but we don't learn about the nice shapes about the bounding boxes. Uh, and we're sort of like, are on, again in a sort of a mode collapse. So how can we diversify again the output of our neural network? So we introduced here at the bottom for the real images. So the way we generated the real images before that was to take an image, find a silhouette, uh, apply a 2D bounding box on top of the silhouette, and then after that, train our discriminator. But really, you can think about the bottom part of creating a real image as the process that we're trying to achieve at the top. Right? So instead of having uh, to do it manually, what about we have the neural network actually achieving that task? So this is what we achieve, and we're sort of like sharing the weight. So we're forcing the neural network to learn uh, to output these 2D bounding boxes. Uh, and we're going to apply a uh, supervised loss at the bottom. So we're sort of trying to leverage as much knowledge as we have from our, our, our data set. And with the supervised learning, the generative adversarial network, and the autoencoder uh, all put together, we actually can achieve now a nice variety of 2D bounding boxes on the image uh, where the pedestrians on the sidewalk. Okay, so now we know that where we're going to put these objects, and now we need to sort of define the silhouette of these objects. All right, so coming from the previous module we just talked about, we have a 2D mounting box that comes in, and we're going to have a sort of a similar architecture. So we're interested in learning about the distributions of silhouettes that are possible uh, inside a 2D mounting box, and we also want to be uh, respectful to the context of, uh, of oh, interesting. <laughs> so we want to have that respectful of the context of, let's say, it's on the sidewalk or next to a car. So the, it could influence the silhouette of the character. It's a disco show. <laughs> okay, so again, uh, because we're looking for distributions, 
we have, we're gonna use again, uh, very similar as previously, we're gonna run into a mode collapse of outputs of silhouettes as you can see here. So we're gonna pretty much do a sort of a copy and paste of the ar previous architecture as we had. Uh, but we're working on the silhouette space now. We're not working on the 2D bounding box. And again, we're gonna have the supervised loss, this autoencoder loss, and the generative adversarial network loss. And again, and it actually worked pretty well. We're getting some very nice shapes and uh, nice distributions. So here is a little animation. Um, you can see where we selected one sample and we're, you can, we're just generating, uh, we're generating from the random numbers different silhouettes uh, from uh, one character in each image. So I did simplify the neural network architecture uh, some w to, to sort of describe it to you, but some key components that makes this neural network uh, actually end-to-end -end trainable is the bounding box. So we're representing the bounding box as a, an affine transformation over a tensor. So we have this unit square, and then we're gonna apply a matrix multiplication to scale it and translate it. So that allows us to move from the what module to the where module, um, to, so the gradient can flow. Uh, and then also we're using a binary mask in the what module, which is just a simple matrix multiplication. So this makes the whole thing and to end uh, the variable. So some results that we got. So here we is our input to our neural network. So we're gonna figure out that we want to have, I don't know, add a, a pedestrian next to a car. And then what can we do with these semantic maps now? So we just saw a cool talk about moving from semantic maps to, uh, to uh, like video. So we can use the, the same sort of neural network that picks to picks uh, to create these interesting maps. Uh, where we have in the middle our, our pedestrians being added. Uh, another way that we could use this technique is we can look at the silhouette and then we can look in, inside a database and find the nearest neighbor of that silhouette. Uh, here that changed a little bit and then after that we can just copy and paste simply that silhouette onto, onto the street. Uh, it doesn't match really well with, uh, with the actual uh, like the, the coloring and the shadowing and so on, but it's still fairly interesting. And we can achieve the same thing with cars. So here a car, we can generate one using picks to picks. Uh, we can also find the nearest neighbor. So the nearest neighbor is gonna be very similar. It doesn't change that much. And then we can do copy and paste. And then this one really uh, stands out. <laughs> Which brings the question of how can we improve? So in our graphics that we had, when we copy and paste, can maybe as we're copying and pasting, can we can we make it a little a little nicer? No, thank you so much. All right, one more lightning talk: predicting scene graphs. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Gal Chechik. I uh, recently started a research group in uh, Tel Aviv in Israel, uh, aiming to focus on foundational research in deep learning and machine learning. And today I'm gonna tell you about a paper we're gonna present at the main conference on Thursday. Um, so the main question is understanding rich and complex images, and this is a fundamental problem in AI, right? So people can reason about very complicated visual scenes. Take this image for example, I ask you, uh, who's eating bananas? Now, it might take you a few seconds to understand what's going on here. There are a few people. Uh, and then you might notice there's an elephant there on the right. So maybe that brown thing there is not a branch, but a trunk of another elephant. And the woman is uh, handing bananas to the, to the trunk. So the elephant is the one feeding, uh, eating the bananas, right? So we don't have today machines that can reason to such a level. But if we want to progress towards that direction, what should we do? Uh, how can we represent such complex information? What is a good representation for doing reasoning and how do we learn this reasoning from this representation of the data? So one way to think about high level, representing high level information in complex images is the, by viewing images as a collection of entities that interact. And with this view, it's very natural to describe images as a, as a graph where the nodes are objects and relations are on the edges. And if, if you have such a graph, then there's a lot of questions you can answer, like uh, who's feeding the elephant, 
for all elephant feeding movement, right? So there are a lot of questions you can ask once you have a, a good graph, good enough graph. So what we want to do is develop techniques that take a set of boxes on images and create uh, a graph. And when I, when I say create a graph, one of the main problem is you can imagine that you already have all these boxes and connecting edges, but you want to predict the actual labels of each of the boxes. And in machine learning, this problem of predicting multiple labels jointly because they're interacting uh, is called structure prediction. So one of the challenges, what would be, a, what are the good approaches to predict such uh, structured label, joint labels, and combine that with deep learning? So there are several approaches that people have been uh, studying for a long time. Here's one approach, which is a, basically a two-step approach. First, you try to predict, uh, to assign scores to label assignments, and then you search for the best label assignments. So just as an example, again, we have the same image. Uh, you are given an image already with boxes. Here, only focusing on the objects. We later can add relations. And the goal, again, is to label all the boxes. So the first step, you assign some scores, and the scoring function has a lot of different components. First, uh, there's a box appearance component that basically tries to decide what label is good for, for that crop box, uh, man, woman, elephant. Then there's a component that looks at interaction between labels, these label-to-label -label co we can which can also take into account um, spatial combinations. And you can repeat that not only for objects, but also for relations, and then you have all the interaction, object to object, object to relation, relation to relation. And the total score for the full label assignment, again, one set of assignment for full labels, is just a total score of, of the total sum of all these, all, all these scores. Now the problem then is that at the second step, what you need to do is to search over all possible label assignments and find the one that maximizes this score. But the problem is that in the general case, this uh, maximization problem can be NP-hard. So we take uh, an alternative approach that also other people took. And the idea is to, uh, sorry, since this is NP-hard, usually you fall back to, take, to applying some approximation algorithm that can be good or bad. So we take an alternative approach, which is also an approximation, and try to learn an end-to-end -end deep model for the full problem. So now, so now comes the, the tricky part. Imagine that we want to learn a deep model that takes as input this set of boxes and outputs uh, an image. A, a scene graph. What would be good architecture for these, these type of, of deep networks? And this is important because by selecting uh, s possible architectures, this is your way to bake in some domain knowledge, some prior knowledge that you have about the problem. As an example, uh, convolution neural networks, right? They're very effective in part because they uh, are invariant to translations of the images, to shifts of the images. And this makes them very effective for object recognition, for processing uh, images. In our case, the input to our network are not raw images, but rather the set of boxes. So actually, we need our networks to be invariant, to have a different kind of invariance. We actually want to be invariant oops, to the order of the boxes, because the network doesn't care if you give it an elephant and banana, or a banana than an elephant, as long as it's consistent that the output is also right. The elephant eats the banana, not vice versa. So what we want to have is networks that are invariant to these ordering, consistent ordering of the input and the output. And we call these graph permutation invariants. Now, there's been a lot of work uh, on studying architectures, searching for good architectures. But unfortunately, we don't have good theory today that tells us which architect, what type of architecture we should use for, for which problems. So the main contribution of this paper, the first main contribution, is that we characterize a, a specific set of architectures that has uh, this property that we call uh, graph permutation invariance. I'm showing you a sketch of this architecture on the right. It's not the full architecture. I'm not going to go into the, all the details. It's more like a meta-architecture where you can plug in instead of these uh, phi and alpha and rho, you can plug in 
uh, your favorite module, like maybe fully connected or other neural network. And the idea is that these three, these, all these modules are coordinated and organized in a way that such that the full architecture has two very important properties. First, it is invariant to graph permutation, as I described. And second, we can show that actually every function that is graph permutation invariant can be represented as, as this architecture. So there's some alpha and phi and raw that would allow you to represent that function using that architecture. And, and this is useful because it allows us now to just study these type of architectures for the problem of images to scene graphs. L let me also mention, well, of course, if you have, you have a lot of data and a lot of training time, you could uh, hope that the network would learn invariances by itself from the data, right? Uh, same with convolutional neural networks. But by forcing some constraints using your prior knowledge, you hope that you can learn with fewer samples or faster, right? So we tested uh, this uh, just with a small synthetic example here. The task was um, the, you want to predict uh, for each node how many other nodes have the same label. And we just compare several architectures, including LSTM and Fully Connected, all having the same number of parameters. And what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the accuracy. The x-axis is the number of training samples. And the uh, GPI, the graph permutation invariant architecture, managed to learn with fewer, fewer samples. Now, of course, this is just a small synthetic illustration. We also want to test that in a more systematic way. And for that, we use the visual genome database data set, which is uh, designed for learning with uh, scene graphs. It has about 100,000 images. Um, and we use the standard protocols for, for evaluating these type of uh, problems. Uh, it uses 150 entities and 50 relations. And the way this is uh, evaluated is that you predict uh, 50 or 100 top triplets, uh, like entity relation entity, and you measure recall against the uh, ground truth that was computed by visual genome. And our approach was uh, is state of the art. It was outperforming other approaches. Let me let me illustrate that with uh, one uh, example. On the left, you have um, this image. I, I hope you can understand it with all the uh, labels on it. And if I'm asking you uh, who's looking at the bird, you might notice there's a very hungry cat watching the bird through the window. And if you use the graph that was predicted by our method, you can, in, you can answer this question, right? You go, um, bird looking at cat, and you infer the cat is the, the one watching the bird. Uh, as, an ex as a comparison, the ground truth uh, is in the middle, which is almost identical to our predictions. And on the right is a baseline that was not performing that well with this example. Um, I see I'm almost out of time. Um, so let me just summarize. We derived necessary and sufficient conditions for architectures to be invariant to graph permutations of input and output, consistent permutation of input and output. And we showed that this architecture, when applied to the task of predicting scene graph from images, achieve a state-of-the-art performance. And this work was done in collaboration with uh, our, my colleagues in Tel Aviv University and uh, at Bar-Ilan University in Israel. And thank you so much. <laughs>